last weekend, last weekend uh, what did we celebrate? Easter, you were there, awesome. All right, so we had an amazing time celebrating the thing that we celebrate every other week of the year, every other weekend, every other service we're celebrating, the resurrection of Jesus. But on Easter, we really lean in on that. And the cool thing is, is that we have a lot of people that, that come for the first time. And some of you, my people who came for the first time, or maybe it was like your third time, but you decided to step in and say, I wanna make this more of a rhythm where I'm gathering with God's people on a week-to-week basis. And, and that's exciting, that's super exciting. And, and at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, message, we, I gave an invitation to two sets of people, the distant and the disconnected. The distant are people that may have grown up in church land, may have given your life to Jesus. You may have experienced some growth of when you were a kid, but something happened over time that caused distance. Either it was God's people or something you read in the Bible that seemed confusing. It didn't scale well with your adulthood. And so over time, you just basically got more and more cold to the faith or maybe not to Jesus per se, but you, you would identify as a Christian, but that's about it, right? And then there's other people who are disconnected that were sh- showed up last weekend that never, ever put their faith in Jesus. And we gave both sets of people, the distant and the disconnected, the opportunity to to ask Jesus to forgive them and bring them into the life that he had authored for them. And um, and we told everyone, listen, if you came this week, come back next weekend. So if you're here just because of that, I'm stoked. If you're here because this is what you do every single weekend, I'm I'm equally stoked because today we're going to talk about that following Jesus out of distance and disconnection because that's not just a you thing. And it's not just a this time thing or this era thing. This is a 2,000 year old thing where Christians have had a difficult time recognizing that it's very easy for them to feel distant and disconnected from God. And so we're gonna be in Galatians chapter five. And the apostle Paul writes this letter to this church in Galatia. And he's writing to them because he's seeing people who are either just starting their faith, they're just stepping into Christianity, just stepping into following Jesus, but it's easy for them to feel distant and disconnected from the message of Jesus, in part because they were getting this weird sideways message about um, circumcision. Now, if you think that that's, a lot of you like looked up, um, Um, If you think that's awkward, that's because it's awkward. Uh, But for them, it was not just awkward, it was offensive. It was an offensive thing. Um, It was not just talking about was offensive, talking against it was offensive or insisting upon it was offensive. And it it was a weird like niche thing that that church was wrestling with. But a lot of the churches, the early churches wrestled with it. And so we're going to go through that. We'll explain a little bit. But if you can stand for the reading of God's word, we're going to start in Galatians chapter 5 beginning in verse 16, then we're going to jump on over to 13 and go from there. It says this, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Jump on over to 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you're not able to do whatever you want. But you are led by the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All right. So uh, growing up in Southern California, in, and specifically in the early 90s, there was this weird era where uh, 
like a, a bunch of like under, like not underground music as if like it was something sketchy about it. It was just like music that wasn't published or was just getting published or just getting out there by different studios, whether they were Christian or non-Christian, was starting to make its way through Southern California. And you, one thing you could count on was the fact that if you went into basically any industrial park, like the industrial park that's here in like Northern, the North side of Northern, Northern Manuka, Way up there. You know the industrial park? You could count on the fact that they would be renting that space out to bands. And you could show up, like you get a flyer on Monday and the show was on Friday. It was awesome. And, and you could just listen to all these different shows. So I went to these different shows, loved them, listened to some really, really great Christian music um, by way of that. And it was great because I enjoyed the mosh pit, I enjoyed the music, but I really enjoyed the merch table. The merch table was where you got the music and the t-shirts. To this day, if you have, I mean, if you're like just, if you're, if you're selling toilets and there's free t-shirts, I'm going to check out your table. I mean, I just, I, I love it. And it's like, but one of the, the tables that I really appreciated was this, this band that was, that was a local band called Simple Faith. And th their t-shirts were really sweet. It, it just had, it was just a white t-shirt with like this circle with a cross in the middle and it just said simple faith on it. It was like <laughs> simple. But they, then they went and they like, hand, then like they screened this like in someone's, like screen printed in someone's garage. And then they went and they like, like hand tie dyed the inside of the circle. It was so cool. I wore that to like, it wore out. I love that t-shirt. But the thing that was so cool that caught my eye was not just the t-shirt. It was what the t-shirt was talking about. Because honestly, I grew up in church, and faith was a lot of things. It was not simple. Not to me. Faith seemed kind of complicated and convoluted. It was something that I thought, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just dumb. Or maybe I'm just not developed enough. Maybe I'll understand the complexities of faith when I'm in my 20s or 30s or 40s. And here's the thing. When I got in my 20s and 30s and 40s, Still, still complicated. I went to Bible college and that made it even more complicated because I realized that not only is faith seemingly complicated to me, but I found out that Christians fight about some of the weirdest stuff. Not just disagree, fight. And they write books against each other and call each other out like it's a gang battle. It was weird. And it's like, I remember like just thinking, man, that t-shirt was so amazing because I saw on that t-shirt something I desired so much for faith to be something that was different Different than the complexity, different than, than, than the frustration I was feeling when I was thinking about faith. Something that was simple. Something that, that when, I remember when I, when I first gave my heart to Jesus. When I, and then when I was like 13 years old, when I first started seeing that my faith could be personal. Like all of a sudden I was like, man, that's what I, I want to live that way. And, and Jesus does too. Yesterday, I invested an entire day, just about, in something called a track meet. Have you heard of these things? If you have nothing to do with your life and you want to throw a day into something, have a child. And then watch that child join the track team. And your day will go, whoosh, it's gone. Hours and hours and hours of people running. And it, and it was cool watching Rylan run. But here's the thing that I've noticed about track meets, because I was never an athlete and I never ran outside of like away from things. And so when I, when, I saw, when I saw these kids running, I noticed a consistent reality. And I just, every, every race, everything, it was the same. Have you noticed their face? The expression on their face, the, the runner's face? If you took a seizure and you added a heart attack and you threw in a stroke and you encapsulated that, that is a track runner's face. And they're running and it looks like everything inside of them, like, and it's true, they're not, they're not having a good time out there. If there's any appearance, just go and have a good time. Not when they're running track. When you're running track, you are trying to beat a clock that is reminding you how slow you are. You got parents on the sidelines yelling at you numbers that you're trying to compute as you're running past and your face is showing like, I just gotta go faster, but I can't. And it's like, bam, and the pressure and everything else and your face shows it. Now here's the thing, I watched Ryland run and that is the face that he had. But I remembered when Ryland ran at a different point in his life. I remember coming home from work and opening the door, and when I opened the door, I would say, hello, hello, because that's what we say in our house. Actually, I think Rylan was the first person that started saying that. But I opened the door like, hello, hello. And each one of my kids, at a certain point in their life, when they were younger, would scream, daddy, and run to the door. And their face looked different than the track runner's face. Their face was joyful, filled, joyful and joy-filled. 
They, they, they didn't care what you, they don't care how much you make. They don't care how much you, how, how great you perform at your job. They don't, they don't care about, you know, anything. They don't care about how much you own. They just care that you're here and you're here with them. And, and that just like, now honestly, that was a short period of time. My kids don't do that to this day. I don't open the door. Hello, hello. When I open the door, hello, hello. It's like silence except for Bear, my dog. He just runs up and he's excited. I'm like, you don't count. But that period of time, man, when Jesus said what he was after with regard to his followers, he didn't point as an example to the religious elite who knew their religion really well. Who did he point to? Children. It's like, see, see that kid that just barely has gotten potty trained? Who's got his nose is like snotty, he doesn't even have the self-awareness to wipe his nose? That's what I'm after, that kid. Because when that kid sees me, he books it on over to me. Not you people who are just trying to perform and showcase to everyone else how great you are and how holy and righteous you are. Jesus was after a simple faith. Not simplistic, like I don't know anything about God or the Bible and it's all good, but simple, not complicated, not convoluted. And this, again, is not a you problem. This is a a human problem because we've been wrestling with it for this whole time. A lot of people, when they get into this notion of not having a simple faith, they have this idea that there's professional Christians and then there's me. There's people that really know their stuff and me who I'm, I'm for some, something's wrong with my soul or my faith or something, but I'm not there at the profession. I don't know enough or I'm not, I'm not refined enough or something. And so what that ends up producing, if you live in that type of a system, is Christians by label only. But as we said last week, Jesus did not die to label you. Jesus died to transform you. He didn't die so that, you could, so that he would have a bunch of people who would self-identify as a Christian or if you had an option as far as like Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, other, that you would select, you would check the Christian box. He didn't die for that. The label means nothing because lots of people who have the label, it means nothing to them. Jesus' work on the cross, we talked about last week that we're carrying on this week, is to transform you, to restore you, to revamp you. Not so that all, like, you know, Pedro and Napoleon Dynamite, not so that all of your dreams come true, your wildest dreams come true. No, that his wildest dreams for you come true. But we get religious, and that our religiosity becomes a barricade. I mean, look what, how it became a barricade for them in verse 6. In verse 6, it says this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Now, that seems weird to us, but it was fighting words to them. Because for the Hebrew people, your identifier was your ritual and your circumcision. The fact that you were circumcised means something. It means that you're a set-apart people because most people aren't going around having that surgery. And so you're naturally automatically set apart. And so when you have all of a sudden we're following the Messiah Jesus that that the Old Testament prophecies were talking about, then Jesus comes and now we're following the dead and resurrected God who became man and now we're following him. And so the the Hebrew people are like, man, this is great. We're telling other people about Jesus. And they they put their trust in Jesus, ask Jesus to forgive their sins, to transform them. And so now, all right, buddy, I know you're 37, but it's time for circumcision. Here's the knife. And all of a sudden, they started to communicate salvation by surgery, right? It was this idea that if you're really saved, then you do this. If you're really saved, you have this outward thing. And the thing that Jesus was consistently after is like, no, I don't care about the outward appearance. I care about the heart. In fact, the next line is so profoundly radical that I didn't even, I, when I first heard someone preach on it, I didn't think it was, I thought it was out of like a, a, uh, an encouraging book, but not out of the Bible. Listen to what it says. Uh, I actually go back to six. There we go. The only thing that counts, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts. What would you say, how would you finish that sentence? Like for a Christian, if you want to have a mature Christian, the only thing that counts is, there you are. But he didn't say that. (laughs) If you were going to finish that sentence, how would you finish that sentence? A lot of people would look at religiosity and say, the only thing that counts for a mature Christian is that they, they know their Bible in and out. Like the, the most mature Christian knows their doctrine in and out. The most mature Christian is someone that, that is just, and they would fill in, the, the, they fill in that sentence with that. But Paul gets weird and he says this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith in Jesus that expresses itself through love. In other words, you know someone is a mature Christian, the more loving they are. If their faith has caused them to be less loving, 
They're doing it wrong. If you know someone who's been a Christian their whole life and they're less loving the older they get, they're not connected to Christ in their faith. Their faith is disconnected and distant. And that's not what Jesus, Jesus didn't want us to be that way. He wanted us to recognize John, the apostle John, in, in the letter of 1 John says, God is love. No other world religion had ever said that. No other world religion had ever said, you know what God is? He's loving and he loves us. Other world religions would say God or goddesses are creators. They're wrathful, they're holy, they're righteous, but they didn't say love. The Bible is the only one that pinpoints that the one true God is both loving and holy. He's both, both of those things. And when he saves us, when he rescues us, it's not so that we become more wrathful or holy or jerk-like, but instead that we actually find ourselves expressing our faith through love. So everything after this is in that context. When we continue on, look at verse 13. It says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. We'll get to that later, what that means. Rather, serve one another humbly in what? Love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, if you want to take the whole Old Testament, you could say what it's all about is loving God and loving others. Paul abbreviates that even more and says, the entire 613 laws in the Torah, you want to like, just like summarize it? Yeah, yeah, break it down to 50. I'll do better. Okay, break it down to 10. No, I'll do better. Here's one, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're expressing your faith through love with the people that are around you. He continues on in the next verse with this in in verse 16. Actually, it's verse 16. So I say, walk by the what? Spirit. Okay, this is important. The Spirit, this is God. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Scripture says that when, if you've asked Jesus to forgive your sins, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Basically, you have an ongoing life coach within you that's guiding you. That's not just a life coach that you can listen to or dismiss, but it's God himself within you, okay? So this, there's the spirit, and then we got the flip side of that. And you will not gratify the desires of the what? Flesh. What a weird word. It's, uh, the word is sarx in Greek. And there's lots of good definitions. This is my definition. The flesh is this. The unnatural me that seems to naturally run the show. The unnatural me that seems to naturally run the show. And this is how you can tell something's from the flesh. If I'm doing something for me and my, and like, this is my, I'm making my life about me. I'm guided by my desires, my hungers, my drives, whatever. If I'm formulating as myself being the, the epitome, the arbiter of my truth, that's the flesh. And, and that's unnatural because we are naturally created to be, to be in relationship with God. You're God, I'm not, I follow your lead. That's natural. The unnatural me seems supernatural. It seems totally all all the time natural because the things that I'm hungry for or I do that come natural to me that I've done my whole life, I didn't really like choose those. They just kind of, I rolled into them. I rolled out of bed and that was like the natural me. Scripture seems to say that that's not. The natural you is the one that is in relationship with God and moving to love others. That's the natural you. Anything that's in competition with that is in fact the unnatural you that seems to run the show naturally, and that's the flesh. He continues on after that in verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. So that natural serve me, serve me type of attitude is in contrary to God. And, and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now, when I, was, when I first read that verse when I was in high school, I'm like, I will never memorize that verse. So I don't do what I want. I like the life of me doing what I want. But think about it. What would you be like if you got everything you wanted? Happy. But think about it. Like, think about the people that we, were, we, we envied growing up, the rich kids. Maybe you were the rich kid. But there are people that, that, that got everything that they wanted. But think about it. the people that from a child on up that gets everything they want through elementary school, through junior high, through high school, they get everything they want. We have a word for kids like that. What is it? You all know it. Which is such a word, spoiled is such a weird word. Because I mean, it's like, like if you see a banana that's spoiled, you're like, eh. Right? And we're talking about people that way. This person is spoiled. They're rotten. Something, and, but what, we've, what we're saying is that what their parents have conditioned is an environment that has ruined that kid. And the sad thing is that we watch that same person in their 20s and 30s and 40s, and what has happened? It pans out to be kind of accurate. 
that someone who gets whatever they want at this age really is a miserable human being as an adult. It's sad. And what scripture is saying is the same thing is true with our relationship with God. See, because like if I got everything I wanted as a kid, I wouldn't have lived to be nine. Because like at seven, I'm like hand grenade. You know, I mean, that's like, it, would not, it wouldn't have gone beyond that. And so the truth is, is that if we get everything we want, it ruins us. And if we got everything, if we live by, like, I live by, I want this, therefore, I do this. I feel this, therefore, I'm going to do this. I want to say this, and I do. I want to think this, boom, I will. I want to do this, of course I'm going to do this. This is the natural me. I was born to incline myself towards what I desire, and that's how I roll. And if that's how you roll, that's why you're distant. You're distant and disconnected because the God of your life, the spirit of your life is you. It's the flesh. It's really actually the unnatural you. It's not the truest version of you, but it's the one that's the loudest voice and the most influential in the room at the time. He continues in the next verse. He says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Now this is hilarious because um, Paul says the acts of the flesh are obvious and then he could have put a period and said, so I'm not going to even say it. But he doesn't. He keeps on going. He, he lists them out. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, he lists a, a, a set of things that are pertinent to the church in Galatia. These are things that they were wrestling with in the first century. He's not like just pulling things out of a hat. He knows what they're wrestling with. And he's like, okay, so this is some stuff that you guys wrestle with. Because I know, I've, I've talked to you. I've been there. I get it. This is stuff that you rest. Now, if he did this for a Mission Bible Church in Manuka in 2023, the list would be different. We would have some, we'd have some things that would be similar to this. And some of these things on this list would be there, but there's some things on here that, that are unique to them. So we have to know the context of what he's saying. This is unique to them. And he's saying this, and, and, and again, I've looked at this passage as something that is like, these are like the, the, these are the naughty things, the no-no things. Don't do these things. Good Christians don't do these things. Why should I not do this? Well, it's naughty. Why should I not do this? It's sinful. That's not the context of the passage. The passage is, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You want to know what handicaps that? This. The flesh. When we basically say, this is what I want, therefore I'm going to do it. And he gives examples of what that looks like. And so sexual immorality and purity... Basically, um, whenever someone's like, man, we live in the most sexually toxic time frame in human history, or, or you hear Christians that say, we have the most sexually immoral culture, that's just not historically accurate. If you look at first century Greco-Roman society, they have got us beat by a long shot. The things that the most toxic people in our culture would think twice about, they're totally cool with. And so Paul is identifying a group of people that has said, listen, I lived this way and now I'm following Jesus and I'm still doing what I used to do back then. He says, listen, here's some things that you're doing that are actually disconnecting you from from the reality of the kingdom of God inside of you. And the, the first thing he identifies is sexual immorality and impurity. And, and these are basically anything, and this is, this is where it seems super prudish. Um, Paul is saying the natural and normative thing to do with your sexuality is whatever you want to do with your sexuality. That's natural. It's the seemingly most normal thing you could possibly do. And, and we shouldn't judge the world for doing that because if we were in the world, we'd be doing the same exact thing. But when we're following Jesus, we're all of a sudden we realize we're following Jesus, not me. And so I see things the way he sees things. And so all of a sudden I recognize that God's standard for human sexuality is he has it like this elevated. It's just like this thing where it's like, this is so important. It was created for pleasure and awesomeness. And so what I want this to be is something that, that, that you get a chance to reserve for marriage. It's something that, that is within the context of marriage. And it's not for everyone. Not everyone's going to get married, and that's fine. Because this isn't the most fulfilling thing on, human, on, on, on the planet. It's only one of the things that God's created. But if you're going to experience it, here's the way to experience it. And, and if you don't, basically you're saying, I've got desires and I want now what I'm not willing to wait for, for later on. I, I want from this person's body now what I'm not willing to give them with my life. Because that's what marriage is. It's like, I'm committing my life to you. And, I, and when, when I enjoy a sexual relationship outside of that, I'm saying, I want from your body now what I'm not willing to give you with my life yet. And you're not, no one's saying that, but that's what we're saying. And, and for a Christian, and for the world to do that, that's normal, that's normative. But a Christian says, man, you know, here's the thing. I want to be connected to Christ in, in the joy that comes from my salvation. And I don't feel anything in my salvation right now. 
perhaps the reason is, is that I've allowed myself to be the arbiter of that. But he doesn't stop there because a lot of Christians that are like, that are prudish people are like, see? And then like all of a sudden it turns and says, well, what about this? Idolatry. Idolatry is making anything that's good, great. It's taking a good thing, making it an ultimate thing, which is always a bad thing. And so idolatry could be your country's, uh, your allegiance to your country. It could be your devotion to your family. It could, be, it could be progress. It could be money. Any good thing that you make an ultimate thing is an idol. And that, that's a bad thing. Witchcraft. A lot of people at this church wrestle with this one. Maybe not. But witchcraft is basically, in the first century at least, is this idea that I'm going to naturally try to control my environment through, through, through nature and through whether it's spells or whatever. It's, uh, witchcraft is not all Harry Potter. It's, it's like legit, like I want to find a way to control reality around me naturally. And he's like, yeah, you know what? The problem with that is that you're a control freak when you're doing that. And you're not turning to the one true God who's the creator of all things. That's not helping you love more. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. I've got a reason to be angry though. They said this, what was I supposed to do? I got a reason to explode. You should have seen my dad, he was way worse than me. Absolutely. But is this causing you to express your faith through love? No. Dissensions, factions, and envy. Basically finding ways to be divisive or wishing that you had what other people had perpetually. Like I just wish if I only had that person's salary man, if I only had that person's relationship, if I only lived outside of Illinois. <laughs> Not good, folks, right? <laughs> drunkenness. Drunkenness, and, and drunkenness is basically like taking the good thing. God, God, throughout Scripture, we see alcohol referred to in both good and evil ways. The good is, is, is enjoying alcohol in a way that, that is not overly, being overly served or getting just wasted where you're losing control, but having a moderation. The evil is always like letting that thing become your master. When you lose control, when you're all of a sudden you're drinking and you're, you're buzzed into the point where you're not doing what you're naturally inclined to do, when you're getting drunk, then that, that's not who you are. And that's not leading you to, to love. In fact, a majority of people that look back on their college experiences with the regrets that they have were when they were overserved. They weren't leaning into love more. They were leaning into self-absorption more, right? And so, and so we see that. Orgies. Okay, now we put this in. I didn't put this in here. Paul put this in here. And the Holy Spirit inspired him to do that. Why? Because the church in Galatia apparently wrestled with this. These are new Christians, and they're like, I just love Bible study and getting to know Jesus and worshiping God and orgies and I love everything, parades. And, and they're like, whoa, 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 hold on a sec. What? And there's some guy in the church named Frank and he's like, whoa, hold on, hold on a second. Are you telling me that I gotta give up Orgy Friday? Orgy Friday, Paul? For real? And Paul's like, look, it's not because you're a terrible person, Frank, but Frank, you're following Jesus now. You gotta see life the way he sees it. You're saying that it's really that bad? Frank, are you trying to lean into love or are you trying to lean into being more frank? The more frank you think you are, the less frank you're actually being. Don't do that. All right. So then Frank gives up orgies and the like. This helps us understand that and the like, that this is not an exhaustive list, that every culture is going to have something that pushes us away from being less inclined to serve God and more inclined to serve us. Jesus wants to fulfill you, without, uh, give you a fulfilling life where you're not, you don't have a life full of yourself, but full of following his lead and surrendering, etc. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying here not that if you've ever done any of these things, you're going to hell. He's not saying if you've ever done any of these things, you're, you've lost your salvation or something like that. He's saying that if your lifestyle is basically saying, I hear what God is saying, and I'm going to choose to do what I want to do anyway, and that's my lifestyle, then you're indicating that you've declared independence from his leadership in your life. And that indicates that there was never, the, the, the seed of the gospel never took root. Because the seed of the gospel, when we actually fall into sin, we start to have like this conviction, like this isn't, this isn't who I am. This isn't me expressing my faith through love the way that God's called me to do. Now, again, if you do any of these things, you're going to be looked at as a prude, right? But look at this differently. Look at this as progress, not prudish. Like, I, I just want to progress in my sexual ethic away from what's natural and normative to me to what God sees. I want to progress in the way that I, I handle my anger. I don't want to be like that guy who's just off, you know, coming off the handle all the time, f freaking out. I want to be the person that's, that's actually not being divisive and not, you know, I, I've been getting wasted all the time. 
And it was hilarious the first couple times. Now I'm finding myself just getting into a cycle that's, I hate this, okay? So he talks about that as, this is all the acts of the flesh. But then he turns and he says this. He says, but this is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit, this word right here, this, what this, this is what this means. It means internal progress that leads to my external action. And then he lists off what they are. And he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. Forbearance is like patience on steroids. It's like, look, a lot of people would have thrown in the towel by now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stick to it. I'm not going to give up. We're going to keep going. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This, these are indicators that you're finding yourself not disconnected from God, but connected. When you're watching the progress of your life, stepping into these things, all of a sudden you see amazing things start to happen and amazing things start happening in your faith. So just in closing, this is, this is what we're looking at. The way that we step into this reality, walking out of disconnection, is first off by seeing life the way Jesus does. It's choosing to see life, choosing to see sin the way that God sees it, which is going to be different than the way we see things. Choosing to see God's church the way that God, choosing to see people that are all people that are worthy of love, no matter who they are, what they do. I'm choosing to see life like Jesus because God wants to transform us. Nobody has ever, ever been, got, been all about something that was real and awesome and wonderful if it didn't change them, if it didn't transform them. Jesus doesn't want you to just be a Christian by label only. He wants you to see life the way he sees, you, sees it and be transformed by it. Like if I went up to you and I, I was like, look, I've been doing this awesome workout for 15 years. Man, it, and it's been the best thing that's happened in my life. It doesn't change my body at all, in fact, but the, it has it been amazing for 15 years. And most people around me compliment me when they hear that I work out so much by saying, man, you don't even look like someone who actually works out. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> who would say that? Who would say, man, I've been having some really struggle, like mental illness struggles, and so I've been going to see a counselor, and I've been seeing this counselor for six months, and not a thing has changed in my life. I can't wait to go back to this counselor next week. You would say, you need to find a different counselor. I met this amazing woman. I hope to spend the rest of my life with her. She is just phenomenal. I can honestly say that she has had very little influence on my outlook. Doesn't impact my day at all. Honestly, I don't even think about her often. It's great. Best relationship ever. <laughs> I got this awesome new job, so good, oh my gosh. I never show up, I've never had a paycheck, I'm just as broke as when I started, sweet. No one would say any of those things about something that was actually good. In fact, the best things, the best experiences, the most real relationships, they change us and they have to by design and if they don't, they're not all that great. That's, and that's the truth. Even bad influences in our life can, can ch transform our worldview. When I was in fourth and fifth, no, uh, third and fourth grade on El Caminito Street, I had, there was this guy named Dave. And Dave was a, ter he was a bad kid. He was a terrible influence. I was exposed to stuff at third and fourth grade that high schoolers aren't exposed to in, junior, in their junior and senior year. I mean, it, was, it was bad. And I did some messed up stuff in those years, in part because of Dave's influence. Not because Dave was so influential, but because I was so willing to see things the way that he saw them. And I was willing to surrender my outlook for his outlook. That's not just with bad stuff, it's actually with good stuff too. Not only are we seeing life like Jesus, we're also surrendering. We're surrendering our life to Jesus. And this is the thing, if you start to follow Jesus, if you want to be someone who's not disconnected, but someone who's full of joy, the only way that you're going to have a joyful following of Jesus is if you actually experience surrender. And that's like a naughty word. It's like a bad word. It's like profanity for a lot of us Americans. We don't want to surrender. We will never surrender. And the truth is that if you want joy in your relationship with God, you live it surrendered. You basically say, I want to do this. I've got the right to do this. I'm going to choose to do what he wants me to do instead. And that's going to feel like a loss. It's going to feel like a sacrifice. But it's not. In fact, whatever you feel, like whether it was on that list or something else, if you feel like God is calling you to do something and it's different from what you want to do, when you choose not to do this for this, as much of a sacrifice that is, as much of a loss, or you're like, man, I don't even know if I'm going to be the same me. I'm going to feel like a prudish version of me. The, the truth is that I, you are and I am the most me when I'm surrendered to thee. Okay, now I said this super cliche and goofy. This is almost like a dad joke. It's so terrible. But I want us to say this together because I want it to be tattooed on our brain, okay? So let's say this on the count of three, okay? One, two, three. I'm the most me when I'm surrendered to thee. You don't cease to be who you actually are. 
when you surrender to God. You actually find yourself progressively more you. I am more Errol McFadden. I'm more Errol when I choose to live surrendered to God than if I choose to be surrendered to my inclinations and desires. If I live in the flesh, I'm incrementally less and less who I actually am and who I actually am that's gonna be bringing joy in my life. That's just the reality. When I first came to this church, when I first interviewed at this church, they asked, how long can you, would you commit to serving at this church? And I said, 18 months. And in 18 months, I was going to graduate from college. Part of me was thinking I was going to be in a different ministry. Part of me thought I might go back to Southern California. Part of me thought I was going to go, Julie and I talked about going on the mission field to do student ministry in churches that are dying in Europe. And it's like we were like, we were like had all these possibilities. You know what was, was not one of the dreams? Manuka, Illinois. I know that's a shock. <laughs> All of us grew up wishing we could move to Manuka, and you have, you're living the dream. But for me, growing up in Southern California, wasn't my dream. And here's the thing. The amazing thing is, is that that took place a long time ago, 25 years ago. I can't get out. <laughs> and here's the thing. I don't want to. And I'll tell you why. And this is the crazy thing. Because whenever one of your families or one of you as an individual, you go to San Diego, you go visit Southern California, and then you come back to Manuka, you come up to me and you just hold me by my face. <laughs> and you just look at me and say, with pity in your eyes, why? Why? Why did you leave there for here? And the answer is easy. It's Jesus. Manuka kicks the butt of Southern California for me. And I'll tell you why. Because it's no comparison. For me. Because God wanted me here. And wherever God wants you to be, if you are willingly obedient to him, that's the most beautiful place you could possibly be. Now is Manuka beautiful? No, <laughs> but it's the best for me. Now, some people think that not living where I grew up is a sacrifice. It's not, it's a trade. Sacrifice would be listening to God saying, I want you to be in Manuka, and saying, I want to be in Southern California and doing that. That would have been a sacrifice. I would have been sacrificing the joy that comes from just being obedient to God. I don't know what it is in your life, what God is calling you to do, whether it's in a relationship or you individually, but whatever it is that you think is going to be a huge loss by being obedient to God, it's not. It's a trade. It is a trade. But living in surrender causes you to be the most you you could possibly be, which leads us to, to, to celebrate. That's the last thing. Someone who's not disconnected from God is someone who's getting a chance to experience life as someone who sees things the way Jesus sees starts to surrender to their life choices the way that he calls them to, and then celebrates. You probably have seen this online. Uh, we, we don't have the rights to show it to you. I hope you just look it up on YouTube after this, but look up the man on the middle cross. Again, a lot of you have seen this before, but um, I think Julie was the first one that sent it to me. But it's Alistair Begg, this pastor, and he just, it's in the middle of a sermon. And he starts talking about how he wishes that he could just be there to see the thief on the cross, you know, the guy who was next to Jesus on the cross, who Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He says, I just want to catch up with this guy. He says, think about the thief on the cross. What an immense, I mean, I can't even wait to find the fellow one day and ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You didn't know a thing about church membership. And yet, and yet you made it. How did you make it? He says, and that's what the angel must have, must have asked this, the thief on the cross when he got to paradise. He must have said something like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I, I don't know. Well, you... Oh, excuse me. And then he's going to go off and he talks to a supervisor angel. And then the supervisor angel comes back and says, okay, so look, we just got a few questions for you. First off, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? The guy says, I've never heard of it in my whole life. Well, okay, well, whatever. Let's just go straight to the doctrine of scriptural inerrancy. The guy's just staring back at the angel like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And eventually, in frustration, the angel says, 
On what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross. The man on the middle cross said I could come. Alistair Begg continues, now that is the only answer. That is the only answer. If I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me. And as soon as you go there, it'll lead you to either abject despair or horrible, a horrible kind of arrogance. And it's only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance and pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's what Luther says most of your Christian life is outside of you in this sense. That when we know that we're not saved by good works, we're not saved as a result of our professions, but we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. You want to live your life as a simple faith, the simple faith of Jesus. You find yourself celebrating what Jesus accomplished for you. That's why we gather. That's why we show up in the same room, because we're celebrating what Jesus did for us. That's why we sing. We don't sing because we love the songs or we love the sound of our voice. We sing because we are celebrating in words what Jesus did for us. And that's why when we get to baptisms, this church flips out. Because when we get to baptisms, we see the simple faith on display. The simple faith that Jesus died for me. And because of that, I'm rescued and I want you to know about it. That's what baptism is. So when you see people get baptized, what do we do at this church? We freak out. Yes, we celebrate because we're celebrating. And every Christian in the audience looks and says, that, that's me. And it challenges us to see things the way Jesus sees things and live more surrendered and live in a life that's defined by celebration. Let's take a look at the 